Hi everyone, let's talk share-based compensation and earnings per share. So share-based compensation is basically a reward for employees. Um, they can take uh, several different forms. We've got stock award plans, stock option plans, stock appreciation rights. <clears throat> And we give them to employees, you know, sometimes as a performance incentive, sometimes we want to not just reward them, um, but we want to them to be more invested in the company. So we offer them a sales price that is low enough that it is to their benefit to purchase it. And it makes them want to do better in the business, right? So share-based compensation is a common thing, especially for higher levels uh, of employees. Personally, I never received share-based compensation, but there really wasn't share-based when I worked for a you know big accounting firm and then for a college. So unfortunately, this has never been part of my personal um, compensation. But one of the things that we're going to be focusing on is from the management's perspective, not only how they how what they are and how they're treated, but how do we record the expense for them because obviously they're going to be a cost to the company. Okay, so restricted stock plans, um, typically the main types of them are restricted stock awards or restricted stock units, RSAs and RSUs. And there aren't, isn't a lot of difference between the two of them. The difference is primarily due to timing. Okay, um, look at that nice animation. Uh, the restricted stock awards, the first one, is they're awarded in the name of the employee. But the idea is the employee can't do anything with them. Um, they own them, but they can't do anything with them until the vesting period has come. Meaning a uh, vesting period, just to give a little bit of an explanation on that, a vesting period is the time you need to basically work or be employed before you can start using the options. So a lot of times you won't have access to things like stock wards until you have, let's say, five years with the company. And that's the vesting period, the time that you work before you get this reward. Um, the, with a restricted stock award, this has kind of gone away to some degree. Really, the more popular one is the RSU, which we'll go into next. But the restricted stock award, um, the idea is that if the employee leaves, they lose it. And um, let me see. Okay, so they get them. I have to look at my notes. I had to, They get them before um, they actually can do anything with them. So it's really a matter of timing because RSUs are going to be a little bit different, but they get them before they vest. Um, it's They're theirs, but the employer holds on to them. So it's kind of an odd setup. Um, the idea is that the compensation received by the employee for this type of stock award is the cost of the stock, the fair market, far, fair market price of the stock. Now you might think, well, if it's the fair market price of the stock and they're just being given to the employees, isn't that compensation? Well, yes, it is. Um, very often the, the cost of the stock gets included in that employee's compensation for that year, so then they would have to pay taxes on it. Okay, well, it's kind of like a bonus, right, in the sense of that, that they'd have to pay taxes on it. Um, but what a lot of companies will also do is they'll do something called they'll gross up the taxes on it, meaning that, let's say that the taxes on the stock would be, the award would be $2,000 kind of a little low, but let's say it's $2,000. The idea is that the company would calculate, well, $2,000 taxes would be approximately $500. So they will then award the employee an additional $500, but that $500 will then go into federal and state withholding. And then in theory, then they'd have to be paying taxes on $2,500. So then you figure out what the tax would be on $2,500. So they keep going up and up and up until eventually it settles out so that the idea being the employee doesn't bear any of the burden. And they don't have to do this, but it is one thing that companies do because when they award their employee stock options or stock, stock awards, they don't necessarily want them to have to pay taxes on them. So a company can or choose to or not choose to do that. All right, let's look at stock RSUs. RSUs are a little bit more common. Um, the idea is just it's a timing difference. The same idea applies. Um, the employee is being given this as an award. It's, it is a more popular feature because the employee doesn't get them until they vest, which just makes more sense, right? One more point I want to make before we get into some examples. It says the terms might stipulate that either the recipient or this company is allowed to choose whether to settle in stock or cash. So just because you're being awarded stock does not actually mean you have to take stock. What happens in that case is they are given the cash equivalent. It's as if they purchased it and turned around and sold it immediately and then got the cash as the trade-off. Um, so they never actually had the stock. I mean, they did. 
technically from a paperwork standpoint, they had the stock maybe for a day and then they turned around and sold it and got the cash piece of it. Now, my, why might somebody want to do this? Well, because they want the cash, right? They don't necessarily want to hold on to shares of stock. All right. Um, I have nothing to say about this slide. <laughs> Let's go on to the example in a minute. Here we go. Um, under its RSU plan, this is an example, and we're going to be carrying this example forward a little ways. All right. Under its RSU plan, Universal Communication grants RSUs representing $5 million of its $1 par common shares to key executives on January 1st. Shares are subject to forfeiture if employee is terminated within four years. Now, we're doing the RSUs because, like I said, those are more common, more popular. The current shares have a current market price of $12, market price of $12 per share. Well, on January 1st, when you're awarding them to these people, you basically are going to record the compensation. The, the idea is that these people are earning them over the period of time. They're earning them over four years. So you want to spread the cost over those four years. So at January 1st, when you're doing this, you're figuring out what the total cost will be. Well, it's $12 per share times the 5 million shares you're awarding. So it's a total cost of $60 million. What you're going to do is you're going to spread that over the four years that these people need to work in order to earn those shares of stock. So we're going to record compensation expense, basically $15 million a year. All right. So, ooh, wow, I just clicked a little bit too fast, I think. All right. No, I guess it all came at once. Okay. Um, $15 million per year. So every year at the end of the year, as these people work, they're going to be earning it, right? We record the expense in the period in which it covers. So if it's they're earning it over four years, we're going to record it over four years. And our journal entry is going to be a debit to compensation expense and a credit to something called paid in capital restricted stock for 15, which is the $60 million divided by 15, by four years. Um, oh, I'm in the way. Okay, move myself over a little. The journal entry for that at the end, when they finally we finally pay out on it, is we're going to be debiting. This will be 60 by then, right? It'll have accumulated 60 after four years. So it will debit the paid in capital restricted stock. We'll credit the common stock we're actually paying out, and the other credit is to paid in capital in excess of par for the remainder. Um, it's five because if you look back, there you go. It's one dollar par. We always record common stock at par, and everything else go to goes to paid in capital in excess of par. Oh, and there's the math. Look at that. Again, I'm in the way. <laughs> okay. All right, so one quick example. Um, I'm not going to do most of the examples in this chapter just because the chapter is long enough. But just a little thing here. So I'll let you read it. I'm not going to read it to you. Let's go right to the answer and I'll go through it that way. All right. Uh, the idea is that you are going to record, how are you going to record the compensation cost? Well, um, it is 120 million shares. Fair value is five dollars a share, so the total amount is six hundred million. All right, but if they're asking how many years you're gonna, that's the fair value of the shares for the RSUs, the six hundred million. We're gonna spread that over the time period in the next problem. So this goes into two pieces here. Okay, so I'll let you. Oh no, I lied. It's a second example. All right, um, the second example asks you. Well, again, pause me, read it. All right, and here's the solution. All right, so same kind of question. It's take the fair value per share times the number of shares we're looking at, 480 million. But the question it's asking you is it, it's asking you what is the effect on earnings in the year that the shares are granted to executives. So in that year, the idea is you're going to be recording a compensation expense because it's going to be over a three-year vesting period. So the 480 million divided by three years, you'll have compensation expense of 160 million. Okay. All right. Stock option plans. All right, so let's move away from the RSUs um, and the RSAs. Typically, stock option, stock option plans give employees the right to buy a certain number of shares of stock at a certain price during a specified period of time. Now, they're just not being given them. They are paying a piece at some sort of you know, preferential rate. Um, in the past, the way they would measure what that rate was, let's see if I get out of the way, um, would be the market value of the shares, the current shares, minus the price of what they can be acquired for would be the value of the shares. And that's important and we're going to capture this value because it's going to be part of our journal entries. But this is historically. This is not necessarily how it's done now. So they would say, for as an example here, I'll move myself off to, how about I just go off the screen? How about that? All right. Um, an option that permits an employee to buy a share of stock with a market price of $25 for $10. So you're being offered some sort of preferential rate. Um, you're basically making out by $15, right? 
The employee's paying 10, but they're getting value of 25. So that has an intrinsic value of $15. They've since changed the way they recognize fair value um, of options. Uh, they basically made it a lot more complicated than that. Ooh. Um, I couldn't tell you how this is done. This is done at a much higher level. Maybe this is falls into like actuarial stuff. Um, but the idea is that they will come up with a fair value of stock before they just took the fair value of stock as the intrinsic value. Like I said, that number of the fair value of the options is going to come into play with our journal entries and our math. Um, but the point being is that they're now recording compensation event expense not at the fair, not at the intrinsic value, which used to be the fair value calculation, but on some big pricing model that they have now is now the way they do it. We're not going to be asked to do that. That's a whole like whole field of accounting. All right. But let's look at this example. And this example, again, is going to play into um, quite a bit as we go along. And with that, I'm at 11 minutes, so I'm going to start this on the next round.